welcome everybody to our very own question time. I am really honoured and thrilled that we've managed to get such a phenomenal panel of guests here this evening and they've flown in from Edinburgh on the train from London and so it's a real honour that they have given us their time and expertise for us to be able to move forward in this very serious and pertinent topic. We're going to have questions from the floor and I will leave um, the rest to Mr Beverley to start the event. Thank you Mr Beverley. Brilliant, thank you Mrs Grant. Really good to be here just to say um, that I had a briefing call with Mrs Grant and the panellists earlier in the week. Uh, and what was great to hear from them was that they are keen to listen to each other and to you just as much as they are to answer. I think that needs to be the tone of our uh, time today. Let's make sure we're really doing well at listening. Uh, and it's fine if we disagree. It's fine if there are different opinions. We can listen, we can disagree, but we don't have to be unkind towards each other. Uh, uh, can we have a little round of applause for our panel traveling a long way for you? Say, I've told the panelists if I um, butt in, ask them to cut their answer short uh, or go to someone else, it's not because I disagree with them necessarily, or because I'm wanting to be rude. We've got a lot of questions, we want to cover the breadth, we want to move through in the hours we have. So let's get straight on with it. And our first question is from Sophie. Sophie, over to you. Um, how can we go about discussing issues with others who have different opinions on this? Brilliant. How can we go about discussing uh, these issues when others have different opinions? Uh, Katie, can you kick us off, uh, please? Yeah, thank you, Sophie. Um, I think that one big tip would be to start from a position of being open-minded and not outraged. I think if we start angry and cross and, and very sure of our own position, sometimes that just entrenches two parties. I think we saw that with Trump and Biden a lot, didn't we? That they just become entrenched and they don't listen and then you don't engage. And once you are engaging, I've got a really helpful acronym that um, a lovely friend of ours who's actually an Aboriginal rock star, which is a mix you don't often get, um, he's big on, he goes around and tries to help people deal with racism against Aboriginals, but it applies to sexism as well. So it's flute, forgiveness, love, understanding, tolerance and empathy. And I think if we can have those five elements in our conversations, forgiveness, love, understanding, tolerance and empathy, I think our conversations will be much more useful and we will actually listen to each other much better. Brilliant. Thank you, Katie. Uh, Freddie, your perspective, would you want to add anything to that? I don't think, I, I don't think there is anything to add. I mean, that is, flu is brilliant. Um, I think also uh, a really useful topic, a really useful kind of phrase I've heard used is calling people in rather than out. Yeah. So you're kind of bringing people into a conversation. You're trying to understand each other, you know, because there is a, a reason for every opinion, a reason for every position. We're trying to understand what it is that's going on there, and that way we can kind of learn from each other and connect rather than just butt heads really. Fantastic. So not wanting to sort of shut people down or sort of cut them out. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, wonderful to have that tone as we begin our debate. Thanks Sophie for a great question. Uh, let's go for our second question across to uh, Mia. Mia, over to you. Uh, so my question is, what are the hallmarks of a school that takes seriously gender equality and mutual respect, including our LGBTQ plus community? Brilliant, thank you Mia. So the hallmarks of the school, uh, Senior Warden, really pleased to have you here. It shows that obviously the school takes this whole topic area incredibly seriously. For you as Senior Warden, you know, heading up the Governors, what do you think are the hallmarks? Uh, thank you George and, and thanks everybody for coming. Um, uh, actually I've travelled the least distance only coming from Sherman, so uh, I should, you, I, I, your, your applause should be directed entirely at the others. Um, it's difficult for, for, for us as governors to measure this sort of behaviour, but uh, ultimately uh, I think you all know whether or not uh, how you all behave and how you treat each other um, is the key to deciding whether or not we take it seriously. Uh, the governing body itself can't do very little, but certainly the teaching staff and you, you know, look at yourself periodically and ask yourself, am I treating everybody with respect and with equality, whether that's in every sense, not just gender. So it's difficult for us to, to, to measure it, but uh, we certainly take the whole issue of sexual harassment 
uh, and safeguarding very seriously at a governor's level. It is the item, first item on every governor's meeting agenda and we never ever uh, have a time limit on any discussions that need to take place just to reinforce that um, because there are any number of safeguarding issues that can arise and we never want to uh, skim over the, any debate that needs to be had and more information to be passed. Brilliant, thank you uh, Stephen. Really helpful, you know, good reminder for me. It begins with me looking at me and, and how I address these issues uh, rather than just sort of telling others what to do. Um, Finn, would you want to see anything else from a school in terms of hallmarks uh, in these areas? Um, I think you would want to be uh, thinking about do you see yourselves represented so in senior and high profile positions in the school are there women in senior and high profile positions are there out lesbian gay bisexual queer trans people in senior and high positions in the school um, are when you look at your mainstream curriculum are you including a diverse range of literature histories biographies from people who would be seen as out with the mainstream norm from lives that are not often seen or heard from. Brilliant. Very, very helpful. Uh, Katie, your sort of background and experiences in law, you work uh, as an in-house uh, lawyer, don't you, sort of setting the tone in a corporate world, a workplace world, uh, on what it should look like. What are the sort of hallmarks in that arena that you're looking for? Mm. So I think I want to work in a place, and I think it applies to workplaces and schools, where people can be themselves and they can bring them, we talk about bringing your whole self to work because actually people thrive when they can be themselves. If we're coming to school and having to pretend to be something that we're not or putting on a bit of a mask because we think we won't be accepted, actually we won't perform the best at our academics, we won't be the best we can on the stage or the sports pitch because we're holding a bit back. So I think it's really important that we create a culture where we accept people and we actually celebrate those differences rather than have people think I'm a so this goes to your LGBTQ plus element particularly Mia, but just that people feel they're able to be themselves because actually we all thrive when we can be ourselves. Fab. So it's great to hear you. Stephen saying it's high on the agenda of the governors, begins with us looking at ourselves. Uh, Finn, you're sort of talking about that whole uh, perspective of people in positions and what's on the curriculum. Uh, Katie being yourself. Uh, Daisy, is there anything that you'd want to bring into that or do you feel we've sort of covered all the bases? I feel like you've covered pretty much all the bases there. Brilliant. Just, yeah. Yep. Cool. Okay then. Uh, well, let's move on to our third question here. Uh, so, for our third question, uh, we are over to Emily. Emily. What do the members of the panel think is essential to be included in the current day school curriculum from a sexual harassment perspective? Cool. So, um, what do we need in the school curriculum from a, a sexual harassment perspective? Um, let's go to Finn. Finn, you know your sort of background looking into sort of masculinity, uh, toxic masculinity that often leads into cases of sexual harassment. What would you say? Um, so from that perspective of my work, I can only speak from, from that perspective. And in terms of that perspective, work that is engaging with and promoting healthy masculinities, I think is really important. Um, particularly around, uh, you know, we'll kind of touch on this in question four, but particularly there are specific um, aspects of traditional masculinities that kind of play into issues of sexual violence, sexual harassment. So for example, the, the, the studies have found that there is sort of a particular um, acceptance of violence is one thing that is quite common in, in unhealthy masculinities. Another one is a sort of sense of um, power over women slash sort of women as sexual objects is quite common in these sorts of masculinities. Can I cut in there? So uh, those are really helpful. So you're saying acceptance of violence. What would it look like for me as a teacher or for someone as a pupil to accept violence, what would that look like? So it's, 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 in terms of a school environment, it would be that if somebody challenges you, there comes a point where you have to fight them, basically. Okay. It's that sort of thing. That is kind of talking about that. That's acceptance of violence that is, you know, and actually if you look at films and media a lot, a lot of our films and media are about good men doing good violence to bad men. Yeah. So there's sort of this idea of violence being justified in certain examples, and that can be quite harmful in some ways. Yeah, yeah. Cool, okay, I'll interrupt you. Is there anything else that you wanted to add on? Okay, well let's uh, jump across uh, to uh, uh, Daisy. Uh, Daisy, um, when you sort of think about school curriculum from a sexual harassment perspective, obviously you've been involved with Everyone's Invited. What are the things you're hoping schools will really have on the curriculum? 
So I think something that we don't see that much in school curriculums is like a really robust and comprehensive understanding of what consent is. And that has to go beyond, you know, like, no means no. Like, it is more complex than that. And schools are really engaging this issue, perhaps, like, inviting students to go through scenarios, like, what does consent look like when alcohol is involved, like, for example. Mm -hmm. And another thing we talk about, everyone's invited a lot, is language. So can we empower students and, like, young people with language to then point out sexual harassment, sexual violence? So, do you know what coercive, coercive behaviour looks like? Do you know the definition of upskirting? Do you know what cyber flashing is? Come on, let's, let's cut in there. So let's, let's give us some of these <laughs> definitions. Come on, I'm interested to hear, because yeah. I don't think I personally can yeah. actually give you perfect definitions for them. So a new lingo that comes out. Yeah. So, for example, cyber flashing, you want to know what flashing looks like. So cyber flashing would be like an unsolicited, like a dick pic coming into a bone that you didn't ask for, which pops up, which is, it is violence, that is um, sexual harassment, or upskirting, taking photos of someone's skirt with a photo, which is now illegal, but only in the last year or so. And so I think when students have this language, you can more confidently point to it and say, this is wrong, I, I can identify this, I know this is wrong, and then call it out. Brilliant. So yeah, making sure that conversation is really happening. Yeah, and I remember you you in the briefing called, um, you sort of ran through gaslighting. Can you give us your, your sort of understanding what gaslighting is? Yeah. yeah. Gaslighting is one of those terms which is, again, quite complex, but it's where I have an example, for example, like tell you my experience, and you, through little questions, you undermine what I'm saying until I tend to question myself and I'm not sure what's going on. It happens a lot in relationships. Um, and it is a really insidious um, form that we see in great culture. Brilliant. Really helpful. So language as a tool that we can be equipped with so we can identify when we're seeing behaviour that's really poor. Uh, we've got the idea of Freddie sort of really thinking through what, it, what masculinity should involve and shouldn't involve, what's healthy and unhealthy. Uh, Katie, your perspective, obviously in a corporate world, a, wor a working world, you've got to sort of try and come up with a, a framework terms um, in terms of what you want your workforce to be aware of in terms of sexual harassment. Anything you'd want to add from that perspective? I, I guess the only thing that um, I'd want you all to know is what the definition of sexual harassment is legally. So it's unwanted behaviour of a sexual nature which violates somebody's dignity or creates a hostile or intimidating or offensive environment. And the key thing there is, it doesn't matter if you meant it to or not. It's how the person receives it. And that is where I would suggest you get in really good habits now, because if you are really good at banter, or you, you know, it's just joking, or didn't mean it, or everyone does it, now, it, is, it will not be tolerated in the workplace. We are very, very tight on this. And sexual harassment, um, yeah, it's just not, and, and it is never a defense to say, I didn't mean to be offensive, I didn't mean to upset them, because it's how the person receives it. So I just would really encourage you to just get in really good habits now and, and don't think, oh, well, school is just a laugh, because you might come unstuck when you're 24. Brilliant, I want to, want to push you on that. So at school, let's say uh, I crack a joke or something like that, which is clearly uh, not appropriate, is feeding into a culture of sexual harassment. If I did that in the workplace, let's say five years down the line when I'm there, what could that entail for me? Because at school, I might just have to see my housemistress, housemaster. Yeah. Workplace, what might that entail? Well, so it would, it would if, if, if somebody spoke up, which we encourage our people to do, so if anyone is made to feel uncomfortable in the workplace, they're encouraged to speak up to somebody. And when they do that, if we think it's serious enough, then the disciplinary process will um, be kicked into um, process. and. Some, depending on how serious it is, you could get a level one warning or a final written warning, or you could be dismissed. And yeah, yeah, take it really seriously. <laughs> no income, all sorts of issues. Stephen, your background, senior warden, legal. What do you think? Actually, I was going to use my a sporting analogy. You probably, those of you who follow the sports pages, will have been seeing Yorkshire Green Club mm -hmm. having uh, a serious problem with uh, uh, racism. And if you read the articles, it's quite clear. As Katie was saying, it wasn't what the person who they've all said it was just banter. Actually, the, it was how it was perceived by Azim Buzak as to what, how he felt that actually is the issue you need to think about. Uh, so the, the, it, it, it's a very clear illustration, I think, of how that sort of behaviour that some, somebody thinks is banter actually is perceived and taken in a completely different way. 
Uh, and if it touches on any of these particular sensitive areas, then it leads to consequences. Brilliant. Really helpful, isn't it, to think, actually, it's not just my perspective that counts. Actually, it's often the victim or the Correct. receiving person's perspective. And, and sorry, can I just add yeah. one thing? It's also not just the person to whom it's directed. It could be that I overhear Stephen saying something to Freddie. Freddie's fine with it. But I find that it creates a very hostile working environment and I'm the one that speaks up. So it's not just A to B. There are other people involved in that. Really helpful. Because I think often school feels quite a cloistered, safe you know, environment where I can get away with stuff. But the wider world is very different. OK, let's keep moving. Uh, so question uh, number four, over to uh, Charlotte, please. Um, what do you think the first steps are to changing rape culture? Brilliant. So, uh, rape culture. Uh, Daisy, I want to go straight to you. Everyone's invited. Really hot on this topic. Yeah. Take away. Um, Charlotte, I think this is a really great question. Um, <clears throat> and I think the first step is just acknowledging that it exists. And I think that's why events like this are so great. I mean, we're hearing all these questions. Um, we're all discussing rape culture. We're not discussing whether or not it exists. I think it's now a given that it does exist. And just a quick definition um, for those of you who aren't that familiar with the term. Rape culture is when like, our attitudes, our thoughts, our behaviours all work to like, trivialise and to normalise sexual violence. So it's not necessarily, um, I think people focus on the word rape in it and they see that as being very, very serious. But it starts with catcalling, with slut shaming, with groping and it progresses. Mm -hmm. And I think this word culture is also really important. It's not a few individuals, you know, this is something that's embedded in our society. I think we're all. We're all complicit in this culture, and therefore we all have a job to help combat it. Um, so I think in combating it, I think we talk a lot in everyone's devices about not being a bystander. And I'm sure you've had this exact talk with bullying, but it's in terms of sexual violence. It's not, you know, letting things slide, ignoring things. It's about calling people out. It's about standing up for people who maybe can't do it themselves. About listening with empathy and you know, compassion. And it is about being brave because it's really awkward. It can be really uncomfortable doing this. And it is really difficult. And I think I have definitely, you know, not called out everything that I've seen. It's hard, but it's about having that courage to identify and to report and, and to speak. And on that, why would you say don't be a bystander? Because frankly, it's very easy to be a bystander, just to pretend I didn't see it, didn't hear it. Um, it didn't involve me, I didn't say it. Um, why, why would you say really mustn't be bystanders? I think you can't always just be a bystander because the person who this, um, whatever it is, this harassment, if it's abuse, they might not be able to stand up for themselves for a whole number of reasons. It might not be safe for them to do so, they might not like, have the confidence to do so, they might not be the right channels. So you also have a role in seeing it to help report it or help, you know, yeah. yeah, it's a real sense of, isn't it? You know, caring for others, not just yeah. being self-centred, yeah. Um, Dr Finn, so Daisy's obviously outlined, you know, acknowledging it, uh, calling it out. What else do you think we can add to this as uh, the question, first steps to challenging rape culture? Well, I think going back to the previous question, I think it, it has to start wherever you're at. And we have to remember that, you know, this is not just about training you so you don't get some, you know, disciplinary when you go into your workplaces in big corporations. It is also not okay now that we should be schooling girls and young women to accept levels of sexual objectification, sexual assault, sexual harassment, things we would call minor, that if it was done outside in the workplace could potentially be a criminal offence. It is not okay that we see that as all right at school. It should not be all right. There should be a zero tolerance to that. Girls and young women have as much right to enjoy their education safely as a boy or young man sitting next to them. So I think it has to start wherever we're at. All of these attitudes, Freddie has already mentioned it, it's very difficult to challenge these attitudes when they form the basis of our culture. We watch the telly, we watch movies, and what do we see? Girls like bad boys. Men get respect from other men by being violent, by being aggressive, by being competitive. <coughs> We see essentialist and biological claims that excuse men's behaviour, excuse endemic levels of sexual violence, and that perpetuates the whole thing. All of these attitudes, it's called rape culture, there's also another word called conducive context, which is about how all these things at this end prop up the figures at the other end. 
They influence how cases are covered in court. They influence whether people even come forward or not. They influence the low rate, rates of reporting and help seeking amongst men and boys, for example, who fear rightly that if they report abuse, they will be told, well, you're big, why did, why did you part with that? Well, why didn't you fight back? Well, what was wrong with you? Well, men are not supposed to be weak in that way. So it affects reporting rates. It shames and stigmatizes women, so they don't report too. We have one of the, the rape conviction rate in this country is the lowest it has ever been, at 1.6%. It's one of the lowest in Europe. Meanwhile, we have over 80,000 rapes every year, over 400,000 sexual assaults, three women every week murdered by a violent male partner in this country. Those are the extremes at one end. At the other end is the things I'm talking about in our culture. Basically, the sexual objectification of women. Women represented in our culture, in newspapers, in films, in adverts, in magazines, as objects to be graded to be given marks out of 10, to be commented upon. And if we treat women like objects in that way and represent them as objects, don't be surprised then when they get treated as objects in their workplaces, in their homes and in the streets. Brilliant. It's incredibly helpful to see you know, the scale of it, how endemic it often is, and also it matters now. It's not just a case of me trying to cover my back you know, so that when I get in the work world, I, I, I get it right. But equally, you know, I, I've been working in a school for several years now, I know that teenagers get things wrong. They make mistakes, they will say the wrong things, they will treat each other in unkind ways. Hey, I still do as well, we all make mistakes. Um, what do you think there, you know, what would, what would you be wanting to see in terms of a school's response when people do make mistakes? Yes. Should it be, you're cast out? <laughs> I doubt it's not gonna be that. What would you be hoping as a proportionate response to when teenagers as they're most likely to make mistakes in this area. Exactly. We all have, you know, a human right to learn and grow and to make mistakes. As you say, that doesn't stop. <laughs> we carry on learning and growing and making mistakes. So absolutely, that needs to be done in a way that doesn't shame people. Because as I've said, where do young adults, you know, receive these scripts? receive these messages and training from. It is adults in wider culture. It is adults who are creating the culture and creating the content. So it's really unfair then, absolutely to shame and demonize young people when they are trying to work these things out. But I suppose on a daily kind of level, you're talking about a zero tolerance approach, which is not chucking somebody out, but is just making it clear through a kind of broken record technique almost, same as if you hear homophobic abuse or racist language, that you would say, I heard that, you know we don't tolerate that here. That's not going to make other people feel safe. It's not going to make a safe environment for any of us. We don't tolerate it here. Brilliant. So tied, tied into Daisy, if you're on the bias, I say that, calling it out. This isn't how we work at Kingsbury. This isn't our operation. Okay. Uh, loads we could chat about on that whole topic. Freddie, I think we can get more from your masculinity down the line on some of the other questions. I'm really sorry. I'm not going to come to you. Uh, so we're going to jump to our next question. Uh, over to uh, Ellie, please. Did your peers' experiences at school differ from those they faced at university and beyond? Uh, brilliant. So, difference between sort of school and then going on to university in the working environment. Daisy, you're the obvious candidate for this one. Returning to King's, you're at uni at the moment last year. Fill us in. Yeah, I can only speak to my experience of being at school and then at uni. Um, and I think, you know, we've spoken about this as a culture, and it's not just specific to schools and it's not just specific to unis, it's in workplaces, it is everywhere. So I wouldn't say experiences have changed, but I think from what I'm hearing that the tide is changing, even just events like this, I think from everyone's invited, like we have had 64,000 testimonies, which is huge, it's a really big deal. And I think just everyone's being much more open and talking about it. And I think that's so key, um, that this is something that is in the forefront of our minds all the time. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say that it's changed, but, you know, changing. And what sort of things are going on at, like, Edinburgh? What, you know, we're doing events like this here at Edinburgh. What might it look like in terms of students addressing sexual harassment? Sadly, not much from the uni itself. I think the uni's been pretty cool in that respect. Um, but student-led stuff is, is pretty big. I mean, for example, there's a student-led initiative that you can bring it up and they'll walk you home after a night out if you're by yourself or they'll call you a taxi and they'll pay your taxi money. Um, things like that which are combating this kind of violence are really good. I mean, we, Edinburgh has its own, everyone's invited, but just specific to Edinburgh. Um, I'd be interested to ask you also about banter. So I know often at Kings there's a lot of banter 
and often around these sort of areas. Is, is it like that at uni, on the corridor, when you're waiting for a lecture, when you're going out at night? Is that the same sort of banter that um, existed at school? Yeah, I mean, I think there will be bullies and banter wherever you are, if you're in a boardroom, or if you're in a uni hall, or if you're in a classroom, it will be, you know, there are those kinds of personalities. And I think sports culture is often quite, it's bad for this. A lot of, um, you know, societies at uni have a problem with, you know, initiations and hazing, and it, it gets taken too far. And the uni is really trying to address this at the moment. Um, and I think it's just important to realise, you know, it's bad, it, it's obvious to say, but like, you know, it's banter to you, but it does have a massive effect on, on lots of people. Cool. That's really helpful. Uh, Katie, would, would you concur? Does it stop? Or does it get less when you get into the workplace? Uh, or is it just as much of an issue? I think, I think it is just an issue. And you've just got to, you know, I think probably the more money people earn, the bigger the bar bills can become and the more stuff they can take. And, you know, so the stuff you're dealing with now doesn't go away just when you hit 40. So, um, yeah. Sadly, no. <laughs> cool. Okay, um, brilliant. Let's go up to Tom for our next question. Tom, over to you. Uh, what measures have we put in place to ensure people are safe socialising in pubs and clubs? Brilliant. So safe measures um, for when you're socialising in a uh, pub and club. Freddie, I'd like to give, you know, if I'm a guy, uh, here at King's we've got a sixth form club where students can legally be served alcohol under a licence. What would you be wanting to see in terms of men's behaviour in that sort of environment? Yeah, so I think one of the, one of the first things that um, I've also found it useful to kind of adopt in my own life as well is, is having conversations with my female friends about why do they actually feel unsafe. I need to understand that, you know. If there's anything I can do to help, you know, and even just in, 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 in recent times just offering to walk people home, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. And, and I live with my partner and it was only until I moved in with my partner that I realised how important it was uh, for her to live um, the route from the tube station to our flat to be well lit and mm -hmm. I as a <laughs> bald bearded um, slightly stocky man had never thought about that. Yeah. I've just never thought about that. Um, so I think in terms of that it's, it's kind of having conversations from, from, from the role of what, what I can do as a man I think having conversations with people also calling out things as we've said yeah. you know not being a not being a passive bystander calling out things when I see you know friends or anybody else doing things like that um, and there is a question of sort of identity that, that there is a level to which I may be able to step in and be safe in an environment that somebody else might not be able to yeah. step in and be safe in. So there's also things around that and safety is also important, but um, kind of just being supportive yeah. um, of, the, of, 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 of other people in your life, I think, is, is for me the most important thing that I've kind of taken currently. That's really helpful, isn't it? I'm, I'm often ignorant. I don't think how a certain situation might be experienced by someone who's completely different to me in terms of their gender, age, their stature, all sorts of things. But it's really helpful to put yourself in their shoes. Thank you. Daisy, is, is this an issue at Edinburgh? Is there drink spiking going on? Is there stuff like that? What's Sadly, going on? yeah. I mean, I'm not sure if you guys have been reading the news recently, but there's been a huge, huge rise in spiking. And really scary is spiking by injection, which is just not something you really want to think about too much. Um, and more recently, there's been a lot of boycotts or you know, like university towns and cities. Um, students have been boycotting clubs and calling for lots of men to be put in place. Because yes, it's all very well, like say, calling out, you know, checking your peers. But also, you know, what can clubs and bars do themselves? Yeah. So there's been calls, you know, let's, if someone is clearly very drunk, perhaps fight that's not as a bouncer, bring them out on the street by themselves. Let's get a taxi service involved, let's get their friends involved. How can we spell search bags? Are there areas in the club that are safe for me to go and you know, get rid of someone? Um, things like that. Um, and these are really proactive measures that I really hope will be implemented because it's a massive problem. Um, but again, it is about the underlying culture. Like why, why is there increased groping and spiking in clubs? Why would alcohol involved to these issues get much more um, you know, come to the fore? Um, like we need to look at our own behaviour if you buy someone a drink and they say no, are you going to take that as a no or are you going to like keep, keep pressing, are you going to like follow someone on the dance floor, that kind of thing. Really helpful, so sort of there's yeah. both of you sort of raised two problems, A, sort of Freddie, now I need to think what's it like from someone else's perspective being in this situation right now, what can I do from my situation to support them, make them feel safe and secure. Uh, Daisy, you know, let's challenge, let's speak up, let's talk, let's have conversations with pubs and bar owners, really helpful. 
Uh, okay, let's move on to our next question. So we're over to Will. Uh, the clock's ticking away. Uh, Will. Why do you think there is often an unhealthy expectancy of what manliness or masculinity involves? Brilliant, thank you. Well, I think it's a really relevant question. Often at King's Bruton, there is often a bit of a stereotype about what the ideal guy uh, looks like. Freddie, you're immersed in this world with uh, the organisation you speak on. Yeah. Dive in. So, um, I think I need to start by saying that's an enormous question that I really, really encourage you to kind of continue interrogating as well. I'm only going to be able to give you a very, very brief introduction to anything on this. Um, and there is a lot on the topic now. It's, it's something that's been really, really... Um, positive is that men are kind of coming together and everybody else as well we're all talking about this a lot more we're all talking about why you know wh what's going on there is it healthy unhealthy etc but I think in terms of sort of quite generally speaking that in my experience and, and, and my understanding of it is that there's sort of two main aspects of why masculinity can be quite unhealthy and they're sort of to do with the structure of masculinity and to do with the content of masculinity so what I mean by structure is that that the whole way that masculinity operates is incredibly rigid. It's very rigid, there's a lot of policing that goes on. So there isn't much room for flexibility, for freedom, for authenticity. You're not free to be yourself. And part of, part of, part of that is, is, is simply that, you know, masculinity kind of hasn't gone through this process of reflection, um, which it definitely needs to do, and this rigidity kind of keeps us involved in that. Can I challenge you on that? So what would it look like for Kings Bruton, for guys at Kings Bruton to reflect on masculinity? What could, sort of things could we do? So I think um, uh, create spaces for men to come together and talk about uh, actually how traditional ideas of what we should be, mm -hmm. what the impact of that is. I think that's important to interrogate those things, particularly in terms of a well-being and mental health perspective as well, is a really good starting point for that. Okay, so I could be wrong here, but when I think of a traditional man, sort of, uh, sort of understanding, sort of people think, well, they've got to be sort of fairly well built, probably pretty confident, it's a bonus if they're very good at sports, it's great if they've got a girlfriend, it's nice if they're sort of tall and they've got certain colour hair, things like that. And you would say, take those characteristics, have a group of guys sit down and interrogate them, think through why that might be unhealthy? It's, so, so, you know, Finn mentioning earlier conducive culture I think is really important, that, that it may seem that, you know, in, 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 in this moment that it's quite a small thing, maybe if something, you know, those sorts of things, but they do have these massive wider implications, you know, for example, men uh, feeling a pressure to be kind of self-reliant and maybe be in control of their emotions can have huge mental health ramifications later mm. down the line. One of the big things that masculinity does is it impacts men's help-seeking behaviours. So we basically don't ask for therapy, we don't talk to our friends about mental health, etc. So that's kind of also part of what's going on inside it. I think one thing that's really important as well is to interrogate how I police other people's masculinity. So policing, I do myself, but other people do to me. Banter's a really good example of mm. policing. So what's useful to think about is when I am doing banter, when I'm mocking somebody else, what is that instance of mocking? What am I saying to them? So for example, you know, it's obviously not a great example, but off the top of my head, if somebody were to mock me for wearing a pink t-shirt, what is being said there? It's being said that I shouldn't be wearing a pink t-shirt. Why? Okay, well then we get into ideas of masculinity and all this sort of stuff. Um, so that's kind of structure. And then also in terms of, in terms of content, that there's, there's been kind of various studies looking into what's actually specifically in masculinity. And, and the theory we use at, at Voicebox is, is a seven part masculinity and I, I always miss one and I'm going to try and remember what they are and they are emotional restriction, self-reliance, homophobia, acceptance of violence, power over women, dominance culture and pursuit of sort of status yeah. and the last one <laughs> is have I said acceptance of violence? Yeah I have. Don't worry, don't worry, but I mean there's six great areas there. Um, and I'll come, when it comes back to you jump in and tell me and I'll, I'll declare it. But in, in short, we need to sort of put masculinity under the microscope, have some discussions about it, think about what the implications are mm -hmm. that lead to it being unhealthy. Uh, Katie, I remember on the briefing call, you said, you know, not only are you you're a mother of three teenage boys, similar school to here at Canford. You mentioned social media. I just briefly, your thoughts on social media so, fueling this man. I feel deeply superficial that this is my answer, but I basically said to my boys at the dinner table the other night, guys, why do you think there's a really unhealthy attitude about masculinity? And they said, like a shot, social media. 
And I said, what do you mean? And they said, because of all the images that get put on there of blokes, not women. So, you know, what do, you, what do people post? They're, they're gym-ready bodies, basically, and they're six-packs and they're, you know, gym monkey arms. And, and that is what is seen as masculine. And they just said that's really unhelpful because it, you don't see any other image of lads their age, basically. And I think it's very difficult for them... You know, we often say to them, so my husband's a chaplain at Camford, so um, we often say to them, you know, God doesn't look at the things man looks at, he looks at your heart. That is so much more important than your six-pack. <laughs> and I think that that is why, you know, it's so difficult when all you're seeing is this social media feed. And I just, yeah, as a mum, don't be bound by it. Yeah, thank you. That's I really... remember the last one. You remember the last one? What is it? Go on. Rejection of femininity. Rejection yeah, of femininity. Nice. Thank you. I think we're going to have to get you back to come and do a workshop or something. Sorry, headmaster. That's going to cost money. Anyway, right. Okay. Um, Dr. Finn, I know you can speak a lot on that, but actually I want to save you for our next question, which I believe is Kit. Kit. How would you best support and comfort someone who's been through a sexual harassment experience? Um, so yeah, could you kick us off and then Daisy, I'm going to come down uh, to you if that's all right. Um... It's important to listen and give somebody back a sense of control. So sexual harassment and sexual violence is a very fundamental experience of having control or what we might call agency, so like our own will as a person taken away from us, decisions making, taken for us, actions happening that we didn't want to happen. So it's very important to give somebody back a sense of control by listening, by understanding, by not pressurising them to do anything. There is good reasons why people might not want to report something, they might not want to tell somebody, and it shouldn't be an expectation or a guilt trip on somebody that they're somehow responsible for another person's actions if they don't tell or they don't report. The only person responsible for those violent actions is the person who chose to do them. We also know from research that People, not just young adults, but people of all ages, are much more likely to confide in a friend than they are to ever tell anybody in a position of authority about dating violence, family violence, or sexual violence. It's still very stigmatised in society. So I would say another simple thing you can do is like find a number which is out there in the world easily to find for the Women's Aid and Refuge 24-hour helpline for domestic abuse. And then locally we have a group called SARSAS, which is the Somerset Navon Rape and Sexual Abuse Support Service. Even things like that, knowing where to signpost somebody, knowing where to signpost them online. With things like DV, we know that with domestic abuse, we know that people can talk to 11 agencies before they even get the help they need. For black women, that number actually goes up because of responses of institutional racism. So even knowing a number or a website to look at so that you can pass that on to somebody is really important. And believe somebody. You know, always default to you, why would somebody make up stories about sexual violence with all the stigma and taboo around it? Probably not likely to. That's really helpful, actually, because I could sort of think, yeah, I could listen to someone, but then what? Actually, you know what, I'm now resolved to, after this, I'm going to Google some of those charities. I think it might save one of those numbers in my phone, actually, because I think that's a really good thing. If there's a number that I can recommend to someone, you know, someone who's much better equipped than me, brilliant. Daisy, what do you think with your sort of background of everyone's invited? Um, I think that thing that Ben touched on the very end is belief, is just believing in someone. And I think there's a lot of research that shows that if someone, if their most vulnerable comes to you and says, look, I've been through this terrible experience, I'm telling you, and if you turn around and say, well, are you sure? Like, are you sure that happened? Um, like, you be quite drunk, you should remember it, right? Or why are you just telling me now this happened like five years ago? It's really, really damaging, um, and it really breaks that trust. So I think we talk a lot at Evans Divided about affirmative statements, like, thank you for telling me, like, this will stay between us. Like, it's really brave for you telling me um, it's not your fault. And I think then you can go on to the more proactive measures that you just uh, you're talking about. Um, <clears throat> but that belief, I think, is, is really key. Brilliant, that's really helpful. So listening, giving people a sense of agency, control, using agencies and things like that. Um, uh, Freddie, uh, I've got a, a male tutor group. I used to be in a, a boys' boarding house. I remember they used to say, it's not just, it's not just girls who face sexual harassment, you know, guys do as well. That, that is true. I mean, statistically, uh, for, for women, it's far greater, but it does happen to guys. Briefly, succinctly, what would you say if a, if a guy comes to someone and says they've experienced sexual harassment, what would you be wanting to do? I think pretty much the same you would do, just with the particular understanding potentially on the specifics of, of, of how male sexual violence survivors can be quite stigmatised in slightly different ways, I think. 
And I think it's important to kind of understand the ways that those are. Like we mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, that you know, this idea of strength and dominance. There's also a, a sort of societal idea of you know, very, very, very broadly speaking, men go out, look for sex. Women don't give men sex. Is this sort of very? And sometimes that can kind of play into stigma as well. Of well, you know. So to, so to put it in very basic terms, it's not a very manly thing to experience sexual harassment. So when a guy does say to someone else, I've experienced some sexual harassment, that's quite a, a big step to take. Is that what you're saying? Step. And I think believing them is equally as important, you know, all of these things. Um, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Really helpful. Uh, some great questions. So let's go to our next one. I believe it's to uh, Bertie. Um, is there a way that we can reliably and legally identify consent? Brilliant. Reliably and legally identified consent. Senior Warden, uh, Stephen, uh, you've got a big legal career behind you. Is it just um, you know, about uh, legalities in this area? What do you think? Uh, I'm certainly no expert on this particular, but Katie is, and we'll give you the, <laughs> we'll give you the, the uh, chapter and verse on, on the legal side. But don't forget, uh, too often, uh, the whole question of consent is looked at entirely from a legal point of view and of course it is probably the least significant area that you should be thinking about when the whole question of consent comes about. Uh, as somebody said earlier, and, it, and it's not just uh, <coughs> no means no, uh, that you just have to be uh, com completely uh, on side as far as consent is concerned. Uh, and I guess that applies both ways, but typically uh, if you have a room full of, I'm, I'm told if you have a room full of young men and you ask them what do they understand by consent, 80% or 90% will pull up a legal definition and leave it at that, and it's a lot more than that. Brilliant, so it's not just a case of like a legal definition, there's a lot, of, lot more to it than that. Daisy, I remember you, in the, in the briefing call we had a couple of days ago, you had a really helpful acronym that took us beyond that legal definition. Can you run us through that? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I think consent can sound really like clinical and just yes, no, it's just seems like it's a part of you. And I think consent is actually at its heart. It's a conversation. Um, so there's an acronym which is FRIES, which is a bit of a rubbish acronym, but the F is freely given, so it's not any under any coercion or pressure. The R is it's reversible, so it can be withdrawn at any point. Um, I don't forget it now. Um, informed, so it's not under the influence of alcohol or drugs or under your conscious, it's fully informed. Um, e is enthusiastic, I think that's really key that people often in film as well, consent is often portrayed as non verbal, but actually it really needs, definitely does need to be enthusiastically verbal. And also specific, you know, consent to one act is not consent to every other act, you know, you can go so far with someone and you can stop, and that is fine. Um, and I think also, Especially for like all of you guys, like, consent is not just about sex. Consent is about boundaries and relationships and respect. And it doesn't always have to be about sex. It can be about so much more at its core, if that makes sense. That's a really helpful reminder. Do Dr. Finn, do you want to elaborate on anything to do with consent? Just to reiterate, I guess, that you know, since the Sexual Offences Act 2003, the understanding of consent has changed and it is now much more focused on capacity. And that's not just sort of boring and legal. What that means is if you are passing in and out of consciousness drunk, it is up to someone else to assume you can't consent to anything because you haven't got capacity. If you're out of it on drugs, it is up to somebody else to assume that you cannot consent to something because you're clearly out of it. So legal understandings of capacity are now included in the definition of consent. If somebody is asleep, they obviously cannot consent. And it doesn't matter anymore whether the person who accused of something thought they were into it beforehand or they would have been into it if they were awake. It is now just a clear matter of did that person have capacity or not. I also think some of the campaigns around this are very gendered, they're very essentialist. I'm sick of seeing ca consent campaigns which are about give it, get it. And this idea that Freddie has very rightly mentioned, you know, that consent is something that men <coughs> try to get and women decide whether or not they want to give. This is patronising to both women and men. It also removes women's sexual agency, as if you know women don't want to have relationships, sexual or otherwise, with men or anybody else as well. 
Um, and I think also sometimes we can expect too much of young people. I think adults probably have a lot of sexual experiences where no words are spoken, and you certainly don't sit there and work out a contact, contract beforehand about what you're willing to do, what you're not willing to do. Just imagine to yourselves, you would know what sexual harassment probably looked like. If somebody made you feel creepy, this is to men and women, if someone was creeping you out, you would probably know what that felt like. Don't do it to somebody else. Jane, that's, a re that's a really helpful little principle at the end there, actually. You know, creeping someone out, don't do it to someone else. Yeah, thank you. Um, go on. Yeah, yeah, go on, Daisy, yeah. I also think that it's really important to get as much information about this topic as you can. I mean, I've had discussions with friends at uni and you know, people who are a bit older, and they've looked back on experience in the past and with the information they now have, and have gone, oh, like, I don't think that at the time I didn't know what to think of that, but now I have this language, I have this information, and I'm re evaluating things that have happened with a different light. So I think keeping yourself as informed as possible and making this conversation like really count is, is really important. It's a, it's a major thing. We need yeah. to be educated on it, don't we? Yeah, sure. Not just sort of have a, a basic understanding. Great. Okay, um, Freddie, I was going to come to you, but I actually want to go to the next question, because I think you can speak into that. Uh, so next question from Amelia, please. Recently, since the Sarah Everard case, politicians have called on women to change the way they act in public to combat violence against women. What do you think of this as an approach? Okay, so the idea is sort of the, the onus is on women, they need to sort of change their behaviour, uh, to sort of stop themselves being uh, victims of sort of violence. Uh, Daisy, I'm going to go back to you actually first of all. What do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, I've got a very strong opinion on this. Um, I think it fundamentally fails women and girls. And I think it really plays into um, a victim blame narrative that places the onus on women and girls to protect themselves. Um, from sexual harassment and sexual assault. And I think there's already so many things that women and girls do every day to do this. You know, whether it's like you saying what your partner, making sure what your walk to home is safe, you know, you're texting a friend, you're holding your keys, you're not, don't wear this, don't wear that, don't drink too much. And I think it's, it's really awful to have to put this on women, from politicians and the police who are meant to be there, making these say your space is safer, and, you know, these are institutions meant to protect us. And I, I, I absolutely sort of understand and agree with that. So it is, isn't it? This onus on women and them having to be the sort of the active agents and address all of this. But I've had conversations with, with pupils and staff where some of them would say, um, in an ideal world, a woman wouldn't have to think about what she wears, about whether or not it's safe for her to walk down a dark path at night, um, whether or not she needs to take a taxi home, and if the taxi driver is going to be safe. Um, so is it still a case of? being wise to think about this. And Katie, what, what do you think? Well, it's interesting. Daisy and I had a very um, a gracious discussion, didn't we, on the phone? Because I, I'm, I'm, I love learning from people like you, Daisy. It's so helpful for me to hear different perspectives. And I've been mulling over it since we spoke on Monday, actually. And I, I'm really torn because I think, what, I think what my heart is, is I would love to live in a world where we can all wear what we want, when we want, and we can walk home sozzled and no one's going to do anything to us. And, you know, lovely. Sadly, we don't. And when you go to university, you definitely won't. And and so I think what I was, I think what my position is, Daisy, this is for you, is <laughs> so we, I want to maybe we need to manage our risk profiles. And at the moment, there are certain things that will help you manage that risk profile and not expose you to unnecessary risk. But it's not a one-hit wonder. So I'm not suggesting that if we all wore jumpsuits and woolly hats and didn't have any flesh on, you know, then the whole problem would go away, that would just be naive and ridiculous. So I think that it's, it's one little bit of a massive societal problem mm. that's going to need a, you know, so for politicians mm. to say, if we just could nail the way women behave in public, all will be well, that's nonsense. <laughs> that's nonsense, isn't it? But we can manage our risk profile, I think. And women are still, sorry, women are still most at risk in their own lives. Well, women are still most at risk of sexual violence and serious harm from usually men they know in their own homes or a domestic setting. And that was a problem I had with the boycotts around the drink spiking, the girls' night in idea, when actually we know by conservative estimates that drink spiking at least 50% goes on in house parties and flat parties when people feel more safe and are also less likely to report and less likely to help seek because they feel guilty because they know the person who did it. So you are much more safe than going out. I would like to see a curfew on men instead. This is nothing more than putting a curfew 
on women and telling them they shouldn't go out, but they should stay in. What, where you're statistically most at risk? Oh, great, thanks. No, you should go out. Actually, young men are most at risk of street violence. And because we want to maintain the power and the status quo as the way it is, we sacrifice boys and young men to everyday levels of violence, assault, mugging, to maintain male dominance in mainstream institutions of power. Because we don't want to paint masculinity as weak or vulnerable. In the run up to Christmas, why aren't we seeing campaigns urging young men to be careful, not to walk home on their own, to keep money aside for a taxi, to go home with a friend, to stick to lit roots, because they are more likely to be beaten up, marked, bold in the face, stabbed, than a woman is, but we would not see that type of propaganda as it would be seen, because we do not want to represent men and masculinity as weak, and that is to maintain power and to maintain men's dominance. That's a really interesting perspective that I never thought about before in terms of the data that men also face on the street and the decisions that need to be made in that area. I think that really ties in, Freddie, in your whole sort of domain then. Um, masculinity, being a man on the street, what does it entail? What would be a wise thing? What wouldn't be a wise thing? So I think... Yeah, so... Just had quite a strong emotional reaction yeah, to what you said. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, I think I think part of the point here is that actually, and, and this is part of the point that I like to emphasise in the work that we do, that unpicking masculinity and kind of supporting each other in these issues, it benefits all of us. Mm. It benefits everybody. And I think I think putting the onus on on women is, you know, we talk about victim blaming, and I agree with that. I think also, as we've said, you know, there, there's there's a issue around language as well, you know, the term violence against women, who's doing that violence? Mm. It's only being done to somebody, so who's doing that violence? Statistically, it's men. Um, and I think, I think, I think, yeah, I think, I think also there is a, there is a role for men in this, and, and it is a role, and I think it actually doesn't serve the issue when we paint it as men just helping out women. And I think that's why what Finn said is hit me yeah, so hard because yeah. I've been thinking of a way of kind of interrogating that and that has just been brilliant and, and so I think that's part of it is that we're all kind of working on this together it's not about men or women doing this we're all working together to end violence and we can all kind of do that by supporting each other and listening to each other and understanding each other's issues mm -hmm. and understanding specifics of identity you know specifics of emotional labor there's specific things that I can possibly have a conversation around sexual violence but for example, a conversation about physical violence might be quite difficult for me as a man, or, or anything like that, or, you know, so... Brilliant, yeah. really, really helpful, thank you. Yeah. You know, it's not just gonna address one gender, or address many agendas, uh, genders, sorry. Um, okay, next question, over to Jack, please. Uh, how do we measure if there's been a positive cultural shift surrounding these issues? How do we measure if, if, you know, we're making progress in these areas, there's a positive shift, it's not like you know measuring this table here with a tape measure. Katie, I mean, can you measure it in your corporate environment? I, d I don't think you can measure it in, in that kind of nice definable, oh look, we set these X targets and we hit it. I guess one really obvious thing would be if there were less allegations of sexual harassment and abuse in a school, if the, you know, that wasn't, then actually that was because a culture of speaking up has happened, it's not because it's been silenced, and people, are, actually there are less incidents, that would be wonderful. Um, I was thinking actually I wanted to challenge you to be a yoghurt school and not a butter school. I think a yoghurt school, you know how you make yoghurt, you put the culture in and it turns into yoghurt. I think that's what it's culture, it's, it's you all owning it and you all deciding to make a difference yourselves. Whereas a butter school we just beat the butter until it does the thing we wanted to do. And I think so the teachers can stand over you and beat you over the head and say don't do it, don't do it. It doesn't really work because it's not affecting you. So for that yogurt, you know, yeah. let's have a culture within the school that all the stuff that we've been talking about. I'm talking quite quickly because I'm conscious of time. But Thank you. yogurt, not butter. Is my really helpful. <laughs> yeah, Stephen Gott, you've been just to reinforce that, I think you as a cohort of sixth form was incredibly important to that whether you're school prefects or, or anybody else, but all of the rest of the year groups actually do look up to you. And if you are the ones who sit, you're the ones who actually set the culture of the school. And over time, one would hope that if that change, that culture is going to change, you're the ones who are going to institute it because you're there every day, minute by minute. You see what goes on in your houses, on the playing fields, on the away trips, on the expeditions, whatever it is. And actually, you're the ones who they will look up to and will get their lead from you. 
Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, really, really helpful. Got a lot of work to do, but really important work, isn't it? Looking at our culture. Okay, let's jump across to um, Luke, please. Your question. What advice would you give on trying to approach our parents with topics like this? Yeah, what advice uh, we're trying to approach parents on a, a topic like this? We're going to sort of trot through this one. Katie, I remember you in the briefing call. You mentioned books, and I was like, oh no, books, yuck. Um, who's going to want to hear that from here? But actually, you persuaded me. Tell us about books. So this is me. I'm putting, taking off my employment lawyer hat on and putting my parent hat on. What we've done with our three boys, if we've tried to always have a culture where we talk very openly about sex and relationships, so it's something that my husband and I don't get at all embarrassed about. We talk about it a lot. So, and, and I appreciate that's difficult if you haven't had that with your parents so far. But perhaps one way to springboard is to say, Mum and Dad, we had this really great session and tell them about today and maybe use some of these questions to say, look, one of the things we spoke about was this. What would you have said to that? And just get your, your parents, they will feel as awkward as you if they're not used to it. So put them at their ease, you know, try top tip, do it on car journeys when you're not looking at each other and you can gaze out the window and not have to eyeball them, that always helps. But if you, if you want the conversation and your parents aren't instigating it, give them easy ways in. So give them springboard questions. What do you think? Watch stuff with them. You know, there are so many TV shows or films or Netflix series which have got all sorts of these themes in them. But at the end, analyze it together. What does that say about our culture? That was interesting that that was his relation. Talk to each other about it. And the last one is, yeah, my kids and I and my husband, we we've read books together. So we've read some pretty full on books about pornography, um, harassment, abuse. you know, we just read books because it's arm's length and you can read a chapter and go, that was really interesting, what do you think about that? Rather than, are you watching pornography at the moment? Because I really want to know, you know, so it just gives that little bit of distance and I think it helps the parent-child relationship. Brilliant, and Daisy, what do you say to the person who says, I don't need to talk to my parents about this sort of stuff. Why does it matter talking to your parents about it? Um, yeah, it's obviously quite trivial and often maybe not worth it, but I would say it really definitely is because if you're not able or willing or you're comfortable talking to your parent about anything that we just talked about, about you know, concerned relationships, whatever, down the line, if something goes wrong and you feel unsafe in a relationship or you have an experience that you think would amount to assault or harassment, like you, you won't have that open channel. And I think you'll be really missing out on the support system that is there for you. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't have to be your parents, you know, it could be an, another adult, your parents aren't around or don't want to talk to you about this. It could be, you know, a friend, an adult, a teacher, just someone. I think it's super, super important. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I'm conscious of the time. My phone is saying it's 5.44. We've still got two questions left. What I know would be the case is, um, if you want to hang around and chat to some of the panellists, I'm sure um, they've got, some of them have got a little bit of time, they'd be very willing to do so. But as for now, I'm going to hand back to uh, the headmaster, uh, I believe, is that correct, Mrs Grant? The headmaster. Um, as he comes out, can we give a round of applause to our panellists for today? Carefully, we're going to say now as a school, we're actually unusual. The schools we are not mentioned, and everyone's invited. Last time I looked, however, we all know that we should be or could be. We've got four female Bretonians in here going back 20 years who know that everything that's happened here that we talked about is relevant to all of us. You have heard a huge amount of wisdom in here. This is probably one of the most important events that's happened in this school in my 13 years as headship. We will, we will say thank you again to an amazing panel. Fortunately, it's been filmed. I've been, I've been saying yes, yes, nod, yes. That's amazing. I've been writing things down. I've been watching some of you look at each other and just nod, yes. Dr. Finn's, what she said about rape culture, that was incredible. I just, I'm hopeful I'm going to film, I'm going to write it down again. It was, you had so much experience and wisdom here that's relevant to us. It's not necessarily looking back, what's happened is how we go forward as a school. There'll be lots of conversations between yourselves, in your tutor groups, housemasters, housemistresses at home, and these conversations are really important. I know from the senior warden, who is my boss and me, this is a live, active issues that we are dealing with. We're not brushing up the carpet, we're not throwing the leaves up in the air and it'll come down and we'll just move off or run, that's that done, it's finished. This is ongoing. And the senior warden is quite right. You are influential in the culture of this school. The, the 
third form, fourth form, for example, will copy you. Two things I will say, and really going through a whole lot of everyone's invited uh, testimonies is alcohol is there. One thing that Katie has only just mentioned, which is a huge issue for us, is pornography as well. We haven't got time to go into the pornography, but that's something that we've got to come to terms with as a, as a society, as a community, and as a school, because the impact of that is very, very negative in my view, and I think you'll probably all agree it's got an impact on us. I want us to give a massive round of applause to our panel. Hang on a second, to the panel. I know coming from Edinburgh to here, it sounds, oh, you just get a flight from Edinburgh to Bristol then. That's my home Edinburgh. It's a long, long way away. I know Dr. Finn's got a taxi here. She's coming straight from work, going back straight to work. People have given up a massive of time for you because they know it's important. So we've got a massive round of applause for the panel, but also for the chair, Mr. Beverly. It's really hard to chair anything, I know, doing the meetings. He's chaired it with real skill and passion because he believes in you and he believes in these issues. And the final one we'll, we'll, we'll thank, well, two other things actually, is your questions were incredible. Absolutely amazing. When I read these, I thought, this is uh, absolutely yes, 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 yes. So it's a round of applause to the panel, a round of applause to the chair. But Mrs. Grant, you stop there, please. Mrs. Grant, you come back. <laughs> come back, because we don't thank you enough. And Mrs. Grant has organised this on her own. She's phoned everybody up. The panel, I say, are busy. Getting everybody here is difficult. She believes in you, and it's important for you, and it's her initiative. It's not coming from me saying, sort this out. She's coming to, Mrs. Grant's coming to me and said, I want to do this. Facilitate this, make it happen, it will be important. It was important, but it's ongoing importance. So can we give Mrs. Grant, the panel, and Mr. Bethany a huge round of applause? And thank you.